The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, The Eternal Joan, the story of Jeanne d'Arc, as provided by historians, novelists, and playwrights of different nationalities and points of view. Narrated on tape by Louis Cronenberger, author, playwright, and critic. And dramatized by Henry E. Fritsch, with Elspeth Eric as Joan. Margaret, have pity. Pray for her, all ye saints. Oh, Lord God, deliver have mercy her. on her. Burn the witch! Death to the witch! Have pity, say the name! Warm her up, the soldier slut! Tie on the wall! Burn her! Let's get it over with. Burn her to the end! A saint. This was the old market square in the French city of Rouen on the morning of the 30th of May, 1431. The occasion was the burning of a young peasant girl, not much past her 19th birthday. Her name was Jeanette. Her family name was Dark. First without an apostrophe, then with one, after Joan had got her family a noble. We now know her as Joan d'Arc, or in the English equivalent, Joan of Arc. Joan died a fearful death on that pleasant May morning more than five centuries ago. She was tied to a wooden stake, standing on a pile of kindling and firewood, and slowly charred. She had first been excommunicated by her church. We, having seen and weighed all there is to see and weigh, have said and decreed that in the simulation of your revelations and apparitions you have been pernicious, seductive, presumptuous, of light belief, rash, superstitious, a witch, a blasphemer of God, a despiser of him in his sacraments, a prevaricator of the These are actual teaching, quotations from the official record of the trial of Joan of Arc before an ecclesiastical court at Rouen. Erring gravely at our faith, and by this means having rashly trespassed against God and the Holy Church. Therefore we denounce you as a rotten member which must be cast out and given over to the secular power. The secular power to which Joan was given over by her own countrymen, that is, the English army of occupation, did not even take the trouble to hold a trial or to make formal charges. Her sentence took less than a minute. What now, priest? Are you going to keep us here to dinner? Take her! Take her! Jesus! Jesus! Of course! A kind English soldier broke a stick in half and tied it together in the form of a cross. Joan kissed the makeshift emblem and clutched it tightly to her body. A short time later, she was dead. Yet only 25 years later, Joan was cleared of all the accusations that had been brought against her, and she was officially declared a saint in 1920. More than 40,000 statues have been erected to her in France alone, plus many others in other lands, including our own United States. Why? Thousands of books and plays have been written about her in various languages. Why? Here is our own Samuel Clemens. 
Caesar carried conquest far, but he did it with the trained and confident veterans of Rome, and he was a trained soldier himself. Napoleon swept away the disciplined armies of Europe, but he also was a trained soldier, and he began his work with patriot battalions, inspired by the miracle-working new breath of liberty. Joan, a mere child in years, ignorant, unlettered, a poor village girl, unknown and without influence, found a great nation lying in chains, helpless and hopeless under an alien domination. Its king was cowed, resigned, and preparing to flee the country. And Joan laid hands upon this nation, this corpse, and it rose and followed her. But this point alone is not enough to explain the universal appeal which Joan the Maid has had for all the world. Yes, even for the Marquesas Islanders in the Pacific, who to this day are convinced that the English ate Joan, or else why would they have wanted to roast her? There is little doubt about the bare facts, since fortunately complete records of Joan's long trials have come down to us. But for the touchstones of human understanding, we have to turn to those who have tried to interpret Joan on the basis of individual insight. Her historians, novelists, and playwrights of different nationalities and points of view. I'll start at the beginning. It's always nicer at the beginning. I'll begin with my father's house when I was still very small. I'm in the meadow now, watching my sheep. It's the first time I hear the voices after the evening Angelus. That was the voice of Joan herself, describing her first experience with the mystic powers that controlled the rest of her short life. The scene is taken from The Clay of the Lark, written by Jean Arnoui of France and adapted by Lillian Hellman. I still wear my hair in a thick braid. I'm not thinking of anything. I know only that God is good and that he keeps me pure and safe in this little corner of the earth near Damremy. This one little piece which has not yet been destroyed by the English invaders. I live here happy with my father, my mother, and my brothers. Then suddenly, someone behind me touched my shoulder. I know very well there is no one behind me. I turn. There is a great blinding light. The voice is grave and sweet. I never heard that kind of voice before. That day, the voice only said, Be a good girl, Joan, and go often to church. Well, I was good, and I did go often to church, so I didn't understand why the voice spoke that way, and I was frightened. But I didn't tell anybody. I don't know why. second time, it was the noon, Angelus. A light came over the sun and was stronger than the sun. There he was. I saw him. An angel in a beautiful white robe that must have been ironed by someone very careful. He didn't tell me his name that day, but later I found out he was Monseigneur the Blessed St. Michael. Joan. Go to the aid of the king of France and give him back his kingdom. But, Monseigneur, I'm only a girl. I don't even know how to ride a horse. You will go first to Monsieur de Baudricourt. He will give you men's clothes and have you taken to the Dauphin. St. Catherine and St. Margaret will go along to help you. The Dauphin, of course, was Charles, son and presumably legal heir of the last French king, Charles VI. Charles, the father, was generally regarded as mad and had signed a treaty with England 
disavowing his son and recognizing Henry V of England as his heir. He had also ceded all of France north of the River Loire, which gave the English justification for their French campaigns. The Dauphin was weak, yet this was the man for whose coronation at Reims, as Charles VII of France, Joan was to give her life. Her voices had told her that. So Joan received her mission. She didn't leave her native Don Remy right away. She was 17 before she felt ready to set out into the unknown world to help rescue France. For a poetic view of Joan's farewell to her beloved countryside, there is nobody better to turn to than that German romanticist to end all romanticists, Friedrich Schiller and his play, The Maid of Orleans. Farewell, ye mountains, ye beloved glades, ye lone and peaceful valleys. Fare ye well. Through you, Johanna nevermore may stray. Johanna goes and ne'er returns again. Such is to me the spirit's high behest. To Gaul's heroic sons, deliverance bring. Relieve beleaguered realms and crown thy king. And so, instructed by a power higher than any earthly authority, Jeanette reluctantly left her childhood home in Don Remy to become the maid. A few months later, in Reims, Joan saw her great dream come true. The Dauphin, her Dauphin, was anointed with the heaven-sent oil and formally crowned King Charles VII of France. When Joan left home, Papa Jacques and Mama Isabel knew only that their daughter was going to visit her favorite uncle in the village of Biri. But Biri was near Vaucouleur, the residence of Messire Robert de Baudricourt, whom the archangel had directed Joan to see as the first step in her mission. The actual meeting, when it took place, may well have been one of the most hilarious interviews of all time. Here is the version of Bernard Shaw, whose play St. Joan is generally regarded as the classic interpretation of Joan's character and behavior. The loud voice is that of the captain, Sire Robert de Baudricourt. But the first voice is that of his unhappy steward, fresh out of eggs. Sir, I tell you, there are no eggs. There will be none, not if you kill me for it as long as the maid is at the door. The maid? What maid? What are you talking about? The girl from Lorraine, sir. From Don Remy. 30,000 thunders I told you to throw her out. You have 50 men-at-arms and a dozen lumps of able-bodied servants to carry out my orders. Are they afraid of her? She is so positive, sir. Positive? Now, see here, I'm going to throw you downstairs. No, sir, please. Well, stop me by being positive. It's quite easy. Any slut of a girl can do it. Sir, sir, you cannot get rid of her by throwing me out. You see, sir, you are much more positive than I am but so is she. You parcel of curs. You are afraid of her. No, sir. We are afraid of you, but she puts courage into us. She really doesn't seem afraid of anything. Perhaps you could frighten her, sir. Perhaps. Where is she now? Down in the courtyard, sir, talking to the soldiers as usual. She shall talk to me a bit. Hello. You there. Come up here. You, soldiers, show her the way. And shove her along, quick. She wants to go and be a soldier herself. She wants you to give her soldiers clothes, armor, sir, and a sword. Good morning, Captain Squire. Captain, you are to give me a horse and armor and some soldiers and send me to the Dauphin. Those are your orders from my lord. Orders from your lord? And who may your lord be? 
Go back to him and tell him that I am neither duke nor peer at his orders. I am squire of Vaudricourt, and I take no orders except from the king. Yes, squire, that's all right. My lord is the king of heaven. Why, the girl's mad. Uh, they all say I'm mad till I talk to them, squire. But you will see that it is the will of God that you are to do what he has put in my mind. It is the will of God that I shall send you back to your father with orders to put you under lock and key and thrash the madness out of well, you. You think you will, squire, but you'll find it all coming quite different. You said you would not see me, but here I am. Now listen to me. I am going to assert myself. Please do, squire. The horse will cost 16 francs. It's a good deal of money, but I can save it on the armor. I shall not want many soldiers. The Dauphin will give me all I need to raise the siege of Orléans. To raise the siege of Orléans? Yes, squire. That is what God is sending me to do. Well, I am damned. No, squire. God is very merciful. You will go to paradise. And your name will be remembered as my first helper. Joan got her horse, her equipment, and her escort. But when her small party arrived at Chinon after a hard ride through 350 miles of winter landscape, she still faced her main problem. How was she, a poor, illiterate country girl, going to get an audience with the Dauphin himself? News of her arrival at Chinon finally reached even the ears of the Dauphin, and Joan was in the end admitted to the court. But to make sure that she was really divinely inspired, Charles and his courtiers decided to play a trick on her. Someone else would sit on the throne and pretend to be the Dauphin, while Charles himself would hide in the crowd of attendants, making himself inconspicuous. Here are two versions of what happened when Joan entered the royal hall of the chateau at Chinon. The first is that of Schiller. As Joan enters, she surveys the resplendent hall, then looks up at the army commander, Dunois, who in this version is impersonating the Dauphin on his throne. Dunois welcomes her. Art thou the wondrous maiden? Dunois of Orléans, thou wilt tempt thy god. This place abandoned, which becomes thee not. To this more mighty one the maid is sent. Joan walks firmly toward the Dauphin, who is peering from behind the back of a knight. She kneels before him. Charles is understandably surprised. Maiden, thou never hast seen my face before. Whence hast thou this knowledge? Thee I saw when none besides save God in heaven saw thee. Bethink thee, Dauphin. In the bygone night, when all around lay buried in deep sleep, Thou from thy couch didst rise and offer up an earnest prayer to God. Disclose to me my prayer, and I shall doubt no more that God inspired thee. Thou didst pray that if there were appended in this crown unjust possession, or if heavy guilt occasioned this most lamentable war, God would accept thee as a sacrifice, have mercy on thy people, and pour forth upon thy head the chalice of his wrath. Who art thou, mighty one? Whence comest thou? Shall I indeed withstand mine enemies? France, I will lay submissive at thy feet. And Orléans, sayest thou, will not be surrendered? The Loire shall sooner run its waters back. Shall I in triumph enter Reims? I, through ten thousand foes, will lead thee. In the modern Anui Hellman play, the Dauphin is no storybook king. As the scene opens, Charles is lolling indolently on his throne, playing with one of those cup and ball toys that still delight children today. Enter the Archbishop of Reims. Oh, Archbishop, you have arrived just in time. I am on the point of governing. There is not time for jest, Your Majesty. We are faced with the dangerous problem of this peasant girl. The people are in love with her. They are convinced that God has sent her to you and that she alone can save France. Mm. They think she works miracles. I have sympathy for them. They are as desperate as I am. As for this girl, I have no curiosity about her. I know too many people as it is. And a messenger from God doesn't sound very amusing. But I want to be a good king and please my people. Therefore, I shall see this girl. I think... I might like to play a trick on her. Let's put a page upon the throne. Let's clothe him in the royal doublet with the fewest patches. He'll look better than I do. And let us enjoy the sight of God's envoy pleading her cause to a page boy. 
And so, when Joan timidly enters the throne room, it's a young court attendant who is impersonating the Dauphin. She sees through the deception, however, just as quickly as she did in the case of Dunois in Schiller's play. She surveys the crowd and walks straight to Charles, who tries to run from her. What do you want? Noble Dauphin, I am Joan the Maid. The King of Heaven has sent me to tell you that you must be anointed and crowned in the city of Reims. Well, well, that is splendid, mademoiselle, but Reims is in the hands of the English, as far as I know. Uh, How shall we get there? We will fight our way there, noble Dauphin. First we will take Orléans, and then we will walk to Reims. God told me, noble Dauphin. You haven't come here to kill me? No. No, of course not. You have an honest face. I've lived so long with these pirates that I've almost forgotten what an honest face looks like. Are there many people who have honest faces? Many, sir. Well, I never see them. Well, all right. Start boring me. Tell me that I ought to be a great king. Yes, Charles. In the end, Joan gets what she wants. Her army, her appointment, and a dazzling white suit of armor especially made for her. Joan's effect upon the English troops, who had been just about invincible until she appeared, is described by Schiller. The voices are those of English soldiers, except for the rather heart-rending lament of their commander, Sir John Talbot. The maiden in the camp! Impossible, it cannot be. How comes she in the camp? Why, through the air. The devil aided her. Why? We are dead men! They heed me not. They stay not at my call. The sacred bonds of discipline are loosed. I cannot rally even the smallest troop. Who is she then? The irresistible, the dread-inspiring goddess who doth turn at once the tide of battle and transform to lion's bold a herd of timid deer. A woman snatched from me all martial fame. The maiden comes. Fly, General. Fly. Well, as we know, the army with which Joan took the field did liberate Orleans and within a few months had cleared the road to Reims so that the Dauphin could be properly consecrated King of France. Joan's army then turned to liberate Paris, but the siege of Paris was called off. Joan, wounded for the third time in a year, was captured some months later by Burgundian soldiers who were then allied with the English. The Burgundians sold her to the English command for 10,000 French pounds, a sum normally paid only for the highest nobles. The English, in turn, handed Joan over to a French ecclesiastical court convened in English-occupied Rouen for trial on charges of sorcery, witchcraft, or anything else that would lead to excommunication. The idea was that once Joan had been convicted on any such charge by her own countrymen, the English would be free to condemn an executor for the damage she had caused them. And that's the way it worked out. Joan, commonly called the maid, having been captured within our diocese of Beauvais and having been surrendered, dispatched, given and delivered to us, as a person vehemently suspected of heresy... After weeks of badgering, Joan, exhausted and terrified of death by fire, finally put her mark to a paper, which she was unable to read, admitting all the sins charged against her and forswearing them for the future. She even resumed female clothing for a short time. But when she found out that her promised acquittal would mean only life imprisonment on a diet of bread and water the bread of sorrow and the water of affliction, as the judges put it. She decided that she preferred a swifter death, however horrible. Bernard Shaw describes her so-called relapse like this. They told me you were fools. You promised me my life, but you lied. You think that life is nothing but not being stone dead? It is not the bread and water I fear. Bread has no sorrow for me, and water no affliction. But to shut me from the light of the sky and the sight of the fields and flowers, to chain my feet, to make me breathe foul, damp darkness, 
and keep me from everything that brings me back to the love of God. I could do without my war horse. I could drag about in a skirt. I could let the banners and the trumpets and the knights and soldiers pass me and leave me behind as they leave the other women. If only I could still hear the wind and the trees, the larks and the sunshine, the young lambs crying through the healthy frost, and the blessed church bells. But without these things, I cannot live. What I am, I will not denounce. What I have done, I will not deny. And we still have from Joan what is perhaps the most touching answer ever given to a life and death question in the history of Inquisition. Joan, do you now believe yourself to be in a state of grace? If I am not, may God put me there. If I am, may God so keep me. That was Joan of Arc. Did anyone ever understand her? Do we understand her today? Perhaps Jean Anouy said it best. You cannot explain Joan any more than you can explain the tiniest flower growing by the wayside. There's just a little living flower that has always known, ever since it was a microscopic seed, how many petals it would have and how big they would grow, exactly how blue its blue would be and how its delicate scent would be compounded. There is just the phenomenon of Joan, as there is the phenomenon of a daisy, or the sky, or a bird. What pretentious creatures men are, if that is not enough for them. You have been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and The Eternal Joan, a treatment of the Joan of Arc story. Written by Henry E. Fritsch, with Elspeth Eric as Joan and Louis Cronenberger, drama critic for Time magazine, as tape narrator. The Eternal Joan was produced and directed by Paul Roberts, music composed and conducted by Alexander Steinert. Included in tonight's cast were Alan Hewitt as Baudricourt and Jack Manning as the Dauphin. Also heard were John Gibson, Daniel Ocko, Bob Dryden, Louis Van Ruten, Roger DeCoven, Ed Prentice, Guy Rep, Ellen Muir, Gladys Holland, and Ruth Tobin. This is Bob Height inviting you to join us next week when from Hollywood we'll present A Portrait of Paris, a word picture of the French capital, recorded by David Schoenbrunn, chief of the Paris Bureau of CBS News. America listens most to the CBS radio network.